I'm Doug Bobst, personal trainer, best-selling author, and entrepreneur, and I'm on a mission to help others become the best version of themselves. So I'd like to welcome you to the Adversity Advantage Podcast, where we will help you use obstacles, failures, and setbacks to give you that edge needed for success. I'll be interviewing people from all walks of life on how they overcame trials and turned them into triumphs. So please, sit back, relax, and get ready to be absolutely blown away by some of the wisdom and stories you're about to hear. Nobody starts to abuse substances thinking that that's the day their life is going to turn around for the better. Right. Okay. That's not the way it works, right? I, I put up a post today on my Instagram, and I think it's really important. Addicts are not criminals. They're not. They're really. humans in pain. People who are depressed are not sick. They're humans in pain. And people who are suicidal are not crazy. They're humans in pain. And maybe if we could stop so desperately trying to define people by what they struggle with, it will be easier for us to listen to their needs. And then we could see that their pain makes sense. Behind every single one of those struggles, there's a human who is desperately trying to reconnect to a meaningful life. There is someone who desperately wants to see that they matter to this world, that they matter to somebody, that they have value to offer. They are desperately trying to reconnect to the meaningful bonds of life. And the start of that connection is simply another human who's willing to listen to them. I'm Doug Bopes, personal trainer, best-selling author, and entrepreneur, and I'm on a mission to help others become the best version of themselves. So I'd like to welcome you to the Adversity Advantage podcast, where we will help you use obstacles, failures, and setbacks to give you that edge needed for success. I'll be interviewing people from all walks of life on how they overcame trials and turned them into triumphs. So please sit back, relax, and get ready to be absolutely blown away by some of the wisdom and stories you're about to hear. Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and do I have an incredible story of redemption. Somebody who is the epitome of using adversity to his advantage. And in 2012, Adam Sud's life was completely out of control, once weighing nearly 350 pounds and struggling with multiple addictions, serious chronic diseases, and mental health disorders. His life nearly came to an end when he attempted suicide by drug overdose. He checked into rehab, and with the help of his parents and a plant-based diet, he began a journey that led to a remarkable recovery and reversed all of his chronic diseases and got off all of his medications, including his psych meds, within one year, and he lost 180 pounds. Adam is the founder of the nonprofit Plant-Based for Positive Change that is dedicated to advancing the research of diet and mental health and addiction, and is running the very first research study to investigate the effects of a plant-based diet intervention on early addiction recovery outcomes. He's an international speaker for the plant-based movement and addiction recovery movement, and Adam has worked in recovery centers using plant-based nutrition as a tool for strengthening recovery and relapse prevention. He firmly believes that the simplest change on your fork can make the most profound change of your life and that self-love is the root of all recovery. And he comes on the show today to share his incredible story of how he nearly took his own life, where he was in those moments of his life, what got him there, and ultimately how he crawled his way out to where he is today. And then we also chat about the importance of health and wellness for addiction recovery and why you know he believes and i firmly believe that it needs to be a staple of all recovery programs to help people not only get into recovery but improve their health as well so without further ado i really am excited to share this conversation with y'all so let's get this thing going and welcome adam sud to the adversity advantage podcast adam man welcome to the podcast thank you so much for coming on bro I'm excited. I know you and I have been wanting to do this conversation for probably the better part of a year, but for whatever reason, scheduling conflicts, but here we are. Let's do this. I'm pumped. Here we are, man. And I really value our friendship and you're such a great guy and an amazing story of somebody who's survived suicide, addiction, eating disorders. I mean, crap, we were talking before we recorded, you lost over 200 pounds and not just physical weight. I think you've lost even more mental weight through the years in your own transformation. And 
it's incredible. Like today, if you were to look at your Instagram page or what you talk about on social media and your involvement with companies like Mastering Diabetes through the years or just do what you're doing now with re- the research you're conducting on how like nutrition can play a pivotal role in mental health and addiction and that sort of thing. Yeah. People would never guess that if they saw your before picture of who you were, that you were somebody who was in psych ward, suicidal, nearly lost your life to addiction, addicted to, to Adderall, right? Yeah, Adderall Ooh. opiates. Yeah. So, and what I think is also, I, I find it kind of common, and you and I were texting about this a little bit yesterday, is a lot of people may not know, but your dad was one of the early developers of Whole Foods, right? He was yeah. with Whole Foods, which again is another... It's ironic in itself that you end up becoming addicted to food and going the polar opposite <laughs> route where <laughs> your dad's like one of the like early on people for like one of the healthiest, like when you say whole foods, what do you think of like health, like organic yeah. food? And the whole thing is kind of fascinating to me in your incredible transformation. So talk a bit about like what it was like growing up in that context with everything that went on with your dad and having him yeah. part of a, of a massive company that was built. And then what led into your initial urge to get involved in addictive behavior what was going on in your mind what were you struggling with mentally and then talk about like where that landed you it's interesting my dad is like sixth generation texan seventh generation texan and grew up in houston we later moved to austin before i started high school but growing up born in 1982 and i had an amazing i had i want to say i want to be very clear like i had an unbelievable childhood I was part of that last great generation that played outside. Yeah. And, I, and I grew up in a privileged neighborhood where I got to ride my bike to school with my friends. We got to play outside every day. We got to feel safe. And there wasn't a lot that I really felt. My parents didn't really spoil me, but I didn't really want for a lot of things. However, growing up, my dad, like, I want to be very clear. Like, my dad is is my hero. And he and my mom are two of the greatest parents anybody could ever ask for. And I also know that my dad has experienced some traumatic things in his life. He watched his dad die from colon cancer when my dad was only 25. And I know that that was an incredibly difficult thing for him to go through because he doesn't really talk about it. Not like he talks about losing his dad, but he doesn't talk about like what it was like to lose his dad. I've never, I've never heard him talk about that. Mm. And my dad, I believe that it had this profound impact on him where he becomes very fearful when he sees someone who is truly meaningful in his life. It represents a, a loving bond that he would do anything for. When he sees whoever that is engaging in behavior that could threaten their life, he becomes fearful. When my dad becomes fearful. He has a tendency to become critical. And this is just his way, I think, for a lot of people it's harder to access that place of acceptance and love and come to that individual and say, I love you. And I'm I'm afraid. And I see this and what do you need? It's, and it can be easier to say, please don't do this. This this is wrong. X, Y, Z, make it a very critical uh, stance. And for me growing up, that's the way it was. I got criticized a lot because I wasn't a fat kid and I don't use fat in like the derogatory term. I, I wasn't a kid who had a larger body, but I wasn't skinny. And I grew up in the eighties was like the greatest era of junk food ever sugary cereal aisle was like heaven right yeah and i got criticized a lot for for my desire to continue to eat these foods and so there was a restriction in our house you weren't allowed to have certain things it wasn't okay to do this and my belief my desire to continue to want to eat these things knowing that my my dad was saying it's not okay i hear you're not okay and I remember I was, it was like 10 years old. So uh, really quick, was it, during this point, was your dad and your mom, were they really into health this time or they did? They, they just... My dad has always been into health. Okay. My dad was the captain of his high school basketball team. He went to the university of Texas, became a marathoner. My dad has always been very, very dedicated to his health. He tried to get me to be a runner at a young age. And I just wanted to, I wanted nothing to do with running. I just wanted to play basketball and, and, and baseball and basketball was really my favorite sport. But for whatever reason, I remember being like 10 years old and running inside. It was summer in Texas. So I was just in my bathing suit and my parents were standing there and they asked me why I already had love handles. Mm. And I'm 10 years old. I don't know what those are. I don't know how you get them. 
And so I'm very confused. And I asked them to, what are they talking about? And they explained it to me. And they said, you shouldn't have them. Most people don't get them until they're in their forties. And right. it was like, I went from loving and accepting myself completely to just within an instant, believing now that there were conditions upon which I was and was not allowed to love myself. And this also presented a very terrifying thought that if there's one condition, what are the others? Right. Why do I not know what they are? How am I going to find out what they are? Who, who is going to be the person that's going to see them, these conditions that I haven't met and say, why don't you know this already? You know? Mm. And I became very hyper aware. I created this way of being, of moving through the world where I had become very hyper aware to the signals that other people were giving me. I was like, what, am I enough for you? Am I enough for you? Why are you looking at me like that? What does that comment mean? Like very, just this unbelievably heightened state of arousal of what is going to be the next indication of whatever condition it is that I'm not meeting to be acceptable to other people. And the next thing that happened was being diagnosed with ADHD. I grew up in the Ritalin generation, but they did a shit job of really explaining like, hey, you know what? Just want you to know, this doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. What we're looking at here is that your brain functions in a way that isn't wrong and isn't broken. It's different and that's okay. And in the school system that we have today, having brain functions or behavior functions that are attributed with ADHD it can be helpful if you take this, this pill called Ritalin and it, it's not going to be forever. And what we're going to do is we're going to help you develop the tools and the skill set to be able to be successful in this environment. And then we'll take the medication away over the course of time. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. You're amazing. That's not what happened. What they said was you have ADHD, so you have to take this pill. And I'm like, well, what the heck is it? Here I am 12 years old. I don't really know what ADHD is. I just hear it as a buzzword. Oh, that's the ADHD kid. That's the ADHD kid. Again, like the label. Yeah. A condition I can't meet, something else broken. And it was like, but here's what we're going to do now. Thankfully, this broken part of you is going to be fixed because what we're going to do is we're going to give you this pill. And thankfully, when you give this pill, you're going to be what everyone wants you to be. So here you go. Here's your solution. It's a pill. Take it. And I believe from that point on, I got this message that there was going to be a solution to whatever was uncomfortable in my life, but it wasn't going to be within me. It was going to be outside of myself. And by the time we moved to Austin, I was just about to start high school. And we moved to an area of Austin, Texas called Westlake. And I started high school at Westlake High School. And to say that Westlake High School is cliquish is maybe the biggest understatement ever. Football was a very big deal there. To put it into perspective, the quarterback of my high school football team when I was a freshman was Drew Brees. And I, I knew no one. I was the awkward kid. I was, again, I was still overweight, not like, not like a, a very heavy kid, but I was overweight. I was awkward. I hadn't really, I was late to start puberty. So it was very difficult for me to make friends. And there were so many friend groups already because most of the kids had come from one of two middle schools in the area. And so everyone already knew each other. And my prescription from Ritalin at the time got switched to Adderall. This was in the 90s. So Adderall was a newly developed medication to treat ADHD. And it's, a, it's an amphetamine based medication. And all of a sudden, I started getting invited to parties. All of a sudden, people wanted me around. And it felt amazing. It felt really good. Because what I wanted more than anything at the time was to feel like I had something of value to offer other people. Something about myself that was uniquely important to other people that they were like, we can't wait for him to show up. And Adderall was that vehicle for me. And then I used it for the first time as a recreational drug. And I was immediately hooked to the belief that this was the greatest solution I had ever found. So you mean recreationally, All you would take your dose and then take more of it. So it was exactly. more for pleasure and not for prescription. Yeah. I, was I took it as a party drug and I didn't mm. know that it was a party drug until I got invited to a party because I had Adderall. Right. And all of a sudden, everything that I believed was not okay about me became solved in that moment. Yeah. You finally felt loved, right? You finally felt that you could have this thing that in your, in I your finally life. felt enough. Yeah. I felt like all the confidence I was lacking was given to me because I became incredibly confident. I had boundless energy. I, I had very, in a very easy time talking to people about whatever they wanted to, to talk about. And 
the other thing is Adderall is amphetamine. That's what the stuff is. So I found a solution to lose weight and, and it worked. I mean, it worked so well. I lost weight. I made friends. I had girlfriends. At the time, my dad and I's relationship was struggling because I had very poor study habits. And if I took Adderall in excess doses, I mean, I could appear to be the person I thought my dad wanted me to be, to be acceptable. And I got a scholarship to the college that I wanted to go to. I mean, it, it was like, you couldn't convince me. There's not a thing you could say that could convince me that this wasn't the right thing to do. And in college, things really started to take a turn because more was never enough. This more was never enough. Never enough was the constant concern. And then that constant concern became how much do I have left? How long will it last? Where will I get more? How much will it cost? Where am I going to get the money to pay for it? Right? That constant mathematical equation and evaluation of your resources and money. And the only yeah. other thing I would add is who do I have to lie to to prove that I'm okay? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Who do I have to lie to to like to convince that, oh, this time when I say I lost my prescription, it's not a lie. Like yeah. I, I, I actually lost it. My backpack got stolen, whatever. All the, all the nonsense that you tell yourself more than you tell other people. And I ended up dropping out of college. I moved back to Austin. And I did it because... I knew that's where I was going to be able to get as much as I wanted, right? I knew the doctors that I could scam. I knew the dealers I could buy from. And I even like, I really believe that I convinced myself that I was going home to take a year off to work in the industry that I was studying. And, but it was like, the, my singular focus was like, get more, get more Adderall, and then work a little bit, get more Adderall and then work a little bit. And I mean, I fell into it hard. I fell into doctor shopping and drug dealing and scamming people and stealing and all of it. I fell into it so hard. And it was like this slight imperceptible movement into that life. It was so gradual and it was so, it was like, I woke up and all of a sudden I was there and I had no idea when it happened. I think there's a sense of like blackout that happens when you first start getting addicted to drugs, right? Because, and you and I agree on this, that like addiction is just the solution to underlying pain, right? Underlying exactly. trauma and mm -hmm. we're rewiring our subconscious for that to be our new normal. So it's just, it's like nothing to just go and start doing drugs yep. like every single day because that's your life now. That's your normal. That's who you are. That's your identity. Yeah. So it's not like, you're not even thinking about like, Oh, like, I'm doing more today than I did yesterday, or I can't believe I'm doing this. I mean, I think there's some sense of shame and guilt, but not a lot when you're in active addiction, like not as much as you right. would think. It's more, you're so focused that, on getting high and how you're going to get it and how you're going to maintain that identity. And I think what you're saying right there is really true because there's so much out there. People say, how can they not know? Right. How can they treat people like that? How can they be okay with the, the way that they're treating other people and themselves and be okay with it? And if you think we're okay with it, you're fooling yourself. Your brain's hijacked. I mean, you, yeah. who you are as a person is completely taken under the control of these drugs and not in a way that you're victimized. It's just reality. And I think yeah. if more addicts could be more self-aware about what's actually going on when they're addicted to these drugs and how some more healthy approaches and other things can give you not the same intensity of the feeling good and the checking out and having the self-confidence as drugs do. But if you go out and get a good workout and do some mm. sprints and run after you've been in shape for a while, you're feeling pretty darn good, right? Well, the thing is that we have individuals who end up becoming incredibly disconnected, right? Yeah. Like for myself, I ended up developing a secondary dependency to fast food. I was consuming 5,000 calories of fast food a day. My weight reached 350 pounds. I was completely disconnected from my family. And when I was around them, I was just constantly like throwing shame and hatred their way. I hadn't worked in over a year. My social network, my friends, I wasn't around them at all. And so if you think about it, here I was, I had no meaningful bond with myself, physically or emotionally, that I, in any sort of loving way, I had no meaningful bond anymore with my family and the people in my life that mattered. I had no meaningful bond with a purpose beyond myself, right? A mission to get up for and be present for. And my future no longer made sense to me in any sort of meaningful way. In fact, the future was terrifying. And living in that state, 
is an incredibly painful experience. Yeah. And what's so amazing about substances is that when you're in that state of discomfort, they're incredibly effective at creating a feeling of being unbelievably successful. They're amazingly successful at allowing you to escape that place that's too painful to be. And you can't convince somebody who's in that state of disconnection that what is so amazingly successful is the worst thing that they can be doing for themselves. Because that individual will say to them, you have no idea how I feel. And you have no idea how incredibly successful it feels when I use. Yeah. I cannot explain to you the biological feeling of success and the emotional feeling of relief that is achieved with zero effort. Well, and, and I think what do we define success as, right? And I think for you and I, it seems what we wanted to feel that we measured success by was like if we liked the person we saw in the mirror. Could we yeah. be confident when we went up and talked to girls? Could mm-hmm. we feel at peace with who we are? Could we be connected to something different than us? And I think yeah. the problem is that when you're addicted to drugs and you're in that active addiction, your self-esteem is so low and you align yourself with people, places, and things that are reflective of how you feel about yourself on the inside. Right. So yeah. when people say, I can't believe that person would make that decision. Well, if somebody's feeling like a, a zero out of a 10, their choices are going to reflect a zero out of a 10 decision, a zero mm-hmm. out of a 10 choice. Whereas if they start feeling better about themselves and say they get into recovery for two, three years, two, three months, whatever the case is, maybe they're feeling like a five or six, they're going to start yeah. making decisions that are more aligned with that level of consciousness within themselves. Right. And I think it comes down to like, what does the future that's presented to that individual look like, right? Yeah. For me, it literally looked like every day was going to be the worst day of my life, right? Every single day was going to hurt more than it hurt the day before. And so when that is the state of belief that you live in, the immediate short-term decision are the only thing that you focus on, right? And I think anybody who's focused solely on the short-term will be misled every single time. Right. And that is a problem that most addicts find themselves in. And I found myself in that. I remember August 21st of 2012. I'll never forget that day. I had come home from shopping and every time I did, I would go into my bathroom and I would like literally just take my shirt off. Like you said, staring myself in the mirror. Yeah. And I would try as hard as I could to hate myself and hate my life enough and hate the person I saw in the mirror enough to want to do something about it. And I would practice self-harm. I would hit myself as hard as I could. And it was, uh, I was in this state of believing that everything that was wrong with me in my life at that moment was the worst it had ever been. And tomorrow was guaranteed to be worse. And that evening I tried to end my life by overdose, overdose of Adderall opiates. I just took a handful of pills and I can remember the feeling of trying to stand up off the couch And my entire right side cramped and it felt like I got shot or like stabbed in the side of my body. And I tried to get up and then it felt like I got stabbed. And then as I bent forward, I tried to get up and that feeling when you get up real quick and the black sort of comes in like this, you you get lightheaded. I saw this black start to fade in and then it just completely shut. And it was like the universe was saying, we're done with you. And I woke up. A few hours later, on the floor of my apartment in a puddle of vomit in the dark, surrounded by nobody, not because they didn't want to be there for me, but because I had made sure to do everything in my power that they couldn't be there for me. Mm. And the feeling of of dying, and I don't don't mean the physical feeling. I talked about the physical feeling that I had. I mean, like the, the feeling of dying, the belief at that moment that I experienced as I saw the light go out was the last one that I would ever have in my life. And knowing that I experienced it completely disconnected from everything that ever mattered to me. And it was like, I used to say this stuff and we were talking about David Clark earlier and David Clark used to say this too. And and he'd say, you know what? I'm going to live my life the way I want. And if it cost me five years, if it cost me 10 years, fuck it. I'm fine with that exchange. You know what? And that's a shit bargain. I mean, we throw that number out there like it's nothing. Five years, five years. I mean, if I had been successful, what would my family have done? What would they do for five more years with me? Five days, five hours. That would be huge. Yeah. I mean, the things that we, 
I think about the feeling that I had lying on the floor after regaining consciousness and just having this unbelievable full body experience of relief. And I found that confusing because I really believed that I was just trying to end my life. But what that relief was asking me to accept was the truth is that that was an attempt to end my pain and that there was something so meaningful about myself and my life that even though I knew today was going to be just as painful, I still wanted to be a part of it. And that there was something that was waiting for me outside of these doors of my disease, outside of the doors of my you know, addiction, outside of the doors of my, my pain that was just non-negotiable that after experiencing the almost loss of it, you couldn't get me to give up on it. And I called my parents and I asked for help and I checked into rehab where I was diagnosed with type two diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, erectile dysfunction, chemically induced bipolar disorder. So it's not technically bipolar disorder, suicidal depression, anxiety disorder, sleep disorder, attention deficit disorder, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And they put me on a cabinet's worth of medication for life. And thankfully, I had about a year before that, had the opportunity, thanks to my dad and his connections with Whole Foods, had the opportunity to attend a seven-day event with a man named Rip Esselstyn, who is the executive producer of the film Game Changers, which is the most watched documentary in history on iTunes. And he's also the author of The Engine 2 Diet. And I learned about plant-based nutrition. It was funny because I go to this retreat and you learn all about it and you think, all right, once, boom, that's it. You're going to change your life. But in that moment, I wasn't ready to give up what was allowing me to escape a life that was too painful a place to be. But now I had a different understanding of what I was doing because now I had an understanding of what was going to happen if I didn't actually change everything about the way that I moved through the world. Right. And I decided I was going to do that. I would, when I got out of rehab, I moved into a sober living facility for 10 months. And during those 10 months, I adopted a plant-based diet. And within four months, I completely reversed my diabetes, my heart disease, and my erectile dysfunction. Within 10 months, I lost over 100 pounds. And within a year, I was off of every single medication that I was put on in rehab, including the antidepressants, the mood stabilizers, the sleeping medications, the anxiety medications, and the ADHD medications. I've had every single diagnosis removed from my chart. And I have found that food and movement have been the greatest vehicle for me to reconnect to those meaningful bonds in life that we talked about before that give me the experience of being alive in a meaningful way. And we can talk about sobriety all we want. Sobriety is simply not using. But when we talk about recovery, recovery is a process of becoming whole. And whether using substances within that recovery process is something you choose to do or not, recovery is always more valuable than sobriety. Because in my opinion, sobriety is simply asking you to abstain. And the abstinence model, in my opinion, is a broken model because what abstinence asks us to do is to accept that what we really want, we can't have, that we're not okay, we can't handle it. But what an acceptance model says is what we really want is what we're choosing, right? And recovery asks us to make a choice every single day to live in alignment with our values, to take a hard, radical, honest look at ourselves and how we want to show up. And we can either choose to be in alignment with it or not. And sure, sobriety is a very important thing, especially within the first year of recovery, because you, you have to have enough time away from your substance for your, your brain chemistry to reset so that you can process. The, the version of myself that checked into treatment on day one completely interpreted things in a very different way than who I was at six months, right? Like I wasn't able to sit still and listen to what people had to say and, and my ability to process information and therapy was completely different. But there is an amazing an amazing transformation that occurs when you make the decisions that you want based on how you're going to connect to what matters most to you in life, rather than how do you remove from your life what you don't want? Because I really believe that negative consequences don't motivate a single person on the planet. I think what negative consequences do is they highlight a meaningful bond in your life that is being threatened, right? So take, let's take diabetes, for example. Nobody decides to eat healthy because they're diabetic. They decide to eat healthy because being diabetic threatens to take a lot of meaningful things from their life. And it's those meaningful things in their life, that's why they make the change. So they can have more of it. So you have more time with it. So they can have a greater connection to it. They can experience it more fully and more completely. And recovery, from, in my opinion, is a process of making choices that are in alignment with connecting greater to those meaningful, loving bonds in your life. And so I've been, I've been in recovery now for eight years, eight years of continued recovery and sobriety. And I have I truly believe that what you and I 
have found. Because look, this as well as I do, the recovery model has a 70% recidivism rate. 70% of people who check in the rehab today are going to be back within a year. And so what is it so unique about us? There's nothing really unique about us. It's the things that we've done that allow us to create this unbelievable experience of being alive in a meaningful way that needs to be presented in a different way to treatment uh, centers across the country, to individuals who are on day one. That the answer is not that you're an addict, always an addict, because that's who you are and your substance is your problem. But rather, how do we get you to live in a way that allows you to regain those meaningful bonds in life so that life makes sense in a meaningful way? I think... Number one, thank you so much. I mean, every time I, I hear your story, I tear up a little bit because it's incredible that you're still you know, alive and what you've taken and just completely transform yourself from the inside out and just on a complete mission to help so many other people and they're not only in their own recovery, but to feel whole through nutrition, through fitness, yeah. through changing their mindset and one thing you alluded to earlier about the recovery model. And I I think what needs to happen is, and you and I agree on this is you have to give people the tools to manage their stress and their emotions in a healthy way when the drugs or alcohol or whatever is is lifted. I think people Mm -hmm. need to reattach purpose and meaning to their life because I think as humans, we all want to get from point A to point B. And that point A to point B in general is we all want to be happy. We want to like who we see in the mirror. We want to be fulfilled. We want to establish connection, yeah. security, self-confidence, attachment to some sense of direction of where we're going in life. The problem is a lot of people choose to do that in a way that's not sustainable and not aligned with who they really want to be as a person. So doing things like exercise, eating healthy, practicing self-care, self-love. And self-love, by the way, isn't just loving yourself all the time. It's checking yourself when when you've done something wrong. It's checking yourself when you need to be held more accountable. It's checking yourself when you've fallen off for a little bit, right? And then also trying to, to give back and using these, the lessons you've learned throughout, you know, your own journey as an addict, as somebody whose life nearly ended to help other people, so what importance has purpose and service? And I'm not talking about service, just helping other addicts. Why well, I do think that's important, but hmm. you're trying to change the world, man, with what you're doing with nutrition and, and yeah. everything. How has that really helped fuel your recovery and just keep you on fire for not being that person you used to be? Well, you know, I think that what we're talking about, one, is that recovery, in my opinion, is a practice of remembering who we've always been before somebody or something else got us to believe differently. Mm. And so I think that humans have a profound need to offer value to others. There's a a British journalist named Johan Hari who wrote the book, Lost Connections. And in Lost Connections, he says that loneliness is not the physical absence of people. It's the sense that you have nothing of value to offer anyone. And so I think that being of service is a human trait that's necessary for meaningful life. And so, yeah, being of service for me has been, I saw this unbelievable glaring hole in the the puzzle of helping individuals have a stronger and greater statistical likelihood of recovery. And what that was is I looked at what happened to me when I was in those 10 months of sober living. I checked into sober living sicker than I've ever been in my life. And in 10 months, I exited sober living, the healthiest I had ever been at that point, right? I'd lost about 130 pounds at that time. I've, I've lost 200 pounds total, but I, I came in with more medications than I'd ever been on and I left on zero. I was more connected to myself in a loving and meaningful way than I've ever been. And I went through this sober living facility, the, the program with about 14 other people, 14 other guys. We all went to the same IOP. We all did the same recovery meetings. And yet at the end of those 10 months, most of them were on the same medications or higher dosages or on more medications, had been diagnosed with chronic disease issues. Yeah, they were sober. But they had, there was a lacking of connection to that meaningful experience of being alive. And I said, okay, well, what's the glaring difference? One glaring obvious difference was the focus on nutrition. And so I decided to, to look into it. And what does the research say? Well, there has never been a single controlled trial research study ever done investigating the effects of any diet and early addiction recovery outcomes. And I thought that is just an unbelievably shocking statistic for me to hear that it's just never been investigated. 
not once. And I decided like, that's what I'm going to do. Well, you know, but real I'm quick, gonna... it's funny. You would think that all these industries are focused on the bad things you shouldn't be putting in your system, but there's no focus on the good things you should be putting in your system. Exactly. That's one of the things like the, the, that message right there, that type of messaging is something that resonates so strongly with me. I can't stand it when someone tells me what not to do. That doesn't tell me what to do. I want to know what I actually need. What next step do I need to take? Like if I was standing at the base of a mountain and there's five paths, one is going to lead to the top and someone says, I'll tell you what to do. Don't take that one. Thanks a lot. You know? Yeah. It's like, how do I get, it's like, I want to know how do I get to the top of the mountain? Like, how do I no, get there? Like, what, which, which one? Path they, you could say it's, it's one of these two. That's great. That narrows it down. Right. But just saying, don't take that one. I mean, come on. So, I mean, maybe that's a shit analogy, but still. And so what I decided was I wanted to run the very first research study and I wanted it to be very thorough. And so I, I connected with a treatment center in Austin, Texas called Infinite Recovery. And then I said, all right, that's the number one. Number one is we got to find a treatment center that's willing to do it. This is an amazing treatment facility. The CEOs are an amazing couple named Michael and Ileana Dadashi, who are just powerhouses in the recovery world in and of themselves. You got to get Michael on your podcast. And then I needed a uh, university to be involved. And you could call it coincidence. You could call it divine timing. At the exact same time. An amazing woman named Tara Kemp, who has been a very dear friend of mine for years, I believe she's been on your show, right? Yep. Was starting her PhD work at NAU. And her PhD work is on something called psychosocial health, which is an interdisciplinary study between nutrition, sociology, and psychology. And I called her up and said, hey, I, I want you to be involved in the study. What do you think about NAU being involved? And she informed me that it was very uncommon for new PhD people to actually bring research that they typically help the lead PhDs with the current research that they're doing, but send her some information. She can talk to the lead PhD and they called me back within 24 hours saying that they absolutely want to do it. They want to do it exactly the way that I want to. They did, all I needed to do was form a nonprofit so that I could fund the research and own the study rights hundred percent, which I had no intention of starting a nonprofit. So I found myself doing that. And the next step was like, okay, now we need to get some MDs involved. And luckily about six months before that, I had uh, the opportunity to be a presenter at an event where I met doctors Dean and Aisha Sherzai, who are the world's leading neuroscientists in the effects of lifestyle and cognitive longevity. They are two of the smartest humans I've ever met. They're the authors of the book called The Alzheimer Solution. And I reached out to them just for a consult. What outcomes should I be measuring for brain health? And I just, I was like, you know what, Adam, be bold. Like, just ask him, do you have any interest in being MDs on the study? What would it take? And their response was, this is incredibly important work. Of course, we're going to be involved. No questions asked. So we have Dean and Aisha Sarazai as the MDs. And we have a guy named Dr. Frank Cusimano, who's our microbiome specialist. And the study is pretty, it's pretty comprehensive. An individual who checks into infinite recovery within the first 24 hours of exiting detox, we'll have the opportunity to join the study. And if they do, they can choose which dietary group they want to be a part of. I know randomized controlled trial is the gold standard of, of research and academia can scrutinize me all they want. I'm not doing this to help academia. I'm doing this to help people. And I know that individuals in treatment, when they're given choice, they feel more empowered and their recovery outcomes are better. They'll choose either the treatment diet, which is a plant-based diet, or the control diet, which is like a paleo elevated Western diet, is the removal of a lot of processed foods. But yes, there's dairy. Yes, there's inflammatory oils. And what we're going to do is we're also going to offer them nutrition education that matches the dietary protocol that they have found themselves in. Because we, you and I know that there's a self-efficacy that's involved, that's gained. We need the benefit that you're offering your body. And then what we're going to do is we're going to measure. We're going to measure various blood biomarkers, like full lipid panel, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker omega-3 levels, which is a, a nutrient involved with brain health, various vitamin markers. We're also going to look at your gut microbiome. In the gut microbiome, you just had Dr. Will B on your podcast. So for those of you who want to know about the gut microbiome, go listen to that episode. The gut microbiome is an unbelievably important aspect of our health. And to help you understand, the listeners on here understand just how important it is, Doug, if I was to take you and I was to count every single cell that makes up the human part of you, it numbers around 10 to 40 trillion. 10 to 40 trillion Doug cells. Now the four to six pounds of bacteria in your gut that are not you, they're not your human, they're, they're not your DNA, these are your foreign bacteria. The number of cells that make up your gut bacteria number 300 trillion. 
So of all the cells that sit in front of me on the screen right now, Doug, you are less than 10% human, which is a staggering statistic when you think about it. If the health of your gut microbiome, which makes up the majority of the cells that exist within you, and we know that they're responsible for the formation of different nutrients that cross the blood-brain barrier that are necessary for creating specific neurotransmitters. And then we're going to look at the changes in the gut microbiome and the blood biomarkers and see how they relate to validated scales of measuring all different parts of your emotional and mental health, resilience, self-compassion, anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive drug use, mania. Uh, we are doing an eating disorder scale, but this is not an eating disorder treatment center. So it's just for data. Um, and what we're going to determine is how does diet help or hinder an individual's early foundation for recovery? Sobriety is not an outcome that we're measuring because this is early addiction recovery treatment. But what I find fascinating about that is because sobriety is not uh, an outcome, the data that we, do, that we get from this study will be applicable to the entire human population. This is truly a mental health study. What is unique about addiction recovery population is that individuals who enter treatment for substance abuse are forced to do the work that every human will have to do to some degree in their life, which is face the dark parts of themselves that are no longer serving them, have the resilience and grace an ability to move through those dark parts of themselves and create positive change. The thing about addiction recovery treatment or addiction recovery population is those individuals have to do the work today because their tomorrow is a lot less promised than other people. We are in the 12th month of the study. And right now, I can't give you specifics, obviously, but the plant-based group is outperforming in every single category. And what I'm saying is that I'm not telling people they have to be vegan. But what we're showing is that there is a direct relation between eating more plants and your mental health outcomes. And when we get more of the data, obviously, we haven't run every single participant, but so far, it's been pretty remarkable. That's incredibly fascinating. And it, and it makes sense, right? Especially from what we know about mental health and nutrition and how when you stick to eating mostly whole foods, you're going to feel better mentally, mm. physically, emotionally, right? And Dr. B, when I had him on, he talked about the connection to the gut microbiome and our brain and how our gut is like our second brain and how much of our yes. mental health is, is tied to that. And like what, 90% of our serotonin is produced in our gut. 50% of our dopamine is produced in our gut. And if eating a diversity of plants is what makes the gut the healthiest, then it would make sense that if you follow that approach, that your mental health would be better. And I would also argue yeah. that that's not even the most important part of it. I mean, yes, it's important. It gets people going. What's more important to me is I guarantee you, Adam, that the people that, because here's, here's two things. There's one thing that people do when they go to treatment. You mentioned this. They have to face their dark uh, demons. The second thing mm -hmm. is they have to reintroduce healthy patterns in their life so that they exactly. don't go back to those dark demons. And if they're making that conscious choice to say, you know what, this diet on the right is full of dairy, has some processed foods or whatever, not as much plants. I'm not going to choose this one. I'm going to choose the one that has more plants. Then they're typically going to probably make better choices in other areas of their life. Absolutely. Because their mindset is shifted to saying, okay, I'm going to choose whichever one is better for my health, not which one tastes better in the moment. Right? Because you can, exactly. You can take it and you can say this decision yeah. is an act of self-care and an act of self-love. It is an affirmation of the value that I have in this moment, right? Like we talked about self-love. Self-love is not about like bubble baths and <laughs> going to the spa and stuff like that, right? Self-love is about loving yourself as you are in the moment and knowing there's still work to do, Yeah. right? It's being okay with what is uncomfortable and letting the moment exist without believing it should be something else. And so practicing self-love says, I deserve to eat these foods, not when I lose the weight, not when I reverse the disease, but in this moment, because in this moment, I am everything I've ever needed to be. And my body deserves this. I deserve this choice. I'm not doing this to gain acceptance at a later date. I'm doing this to show myself the appreciation that I did, that it deserves, like, think about it. I, I abused my body. You abuse your body for how many years? 10 plus years. And look at us now, man. Look at you now, right? If ever there is evidence that our bodies never give up on us, 
it's like looking at you and seeing the things you've done. It's looking at the transformation I've been able to make. Our bodies fight for us since the day we're born. Just watch what's possible. If well, you start think, giving your yeah. body what it wants. Well, and I think subconsciously you want it to collapse in the way you did. Because if yeah. you think about it, like your dad was early on involved with Whole Foods. He was in, incredibly passionate about health. And you knew that eating junk food every day was not going to be good for you, yeah. right? You knew Absolutely. that putting copious amounts of drugs in your system was not going to be good for you. You Absolutely. knew the choices you were making weren't, it's not like you were Ill, uh, uninformed of what health meant, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it was like, that's the thing. It's like nobody, nobody starts to abuse substances thinking that that's the day their life is going to turn around for the better. Right. Okay. That's not the way it works, right? And I, I, I put up a post today on my Instagram, and I think it's really important. Is that addicts are not criminals. They're not. They're really. humans in pain. People who are depressed are not sick. They're humans in pain. And people who are suicidal are not crazy. They're humans in pain. And maybe if we could stop so desperately trying to define people by what they struggle with, it will be easier for us to listen to their needs. And then we could see that their pain makes sense. Every, behind every single one of those struggles, there's a human who is desperately trying to reconnect to a meaningful life. There is someone who desperately wants to see that they matter to this world, that they matter to somebody, that they have value to offer. They are desperately trying to reconnect to the meaningful bonds of life. And the start of that connection is simply another human who's willing to listen to them. Amen, man. And I think that's a good place for us to kind of put a bow on things and wrap it up. And I think you're right. I think for people to take the ball and start rolling it in the other direction with themselves, they have to attach themselves to something greater than them, whether yeah. it's a being of service to others, whether it's having something meaningful they're looking forward to in their life, giving back, yeah. loving themselves, whatever it is. My last question for you though, is this is yeah. picture you're speaking to the Adam who's in that bathroom mm. and who's ready to eat those pills. Who's completely miserable, unhappy, doesn't want to live anymore. I mean, there might be somebody listening to this that maybe they're not suicidal, but maybe they're just completely hopeless and giving up on themselves. And instead of yeah. eating a bottle of pills, they're continuing to drink wine every day. They're scrolling through social yeah. media, comparing what, if you could just say like one or two things to that person to give them some sense of hope, what is it so that they could make a shift the next day to improve who they are as a person? One thing I would say to that person is to just desperately ask them to know that their pain makes sense. Mm. That it's not pathology. It's not crazy. It is a reasonable response to what is going on in their life and that there's nothing broken about them. For the people who are listening to this podcast, for the people who know someone who's struggling, who let's be honest, it's everyone. Yeah. Everybody knows somebody. The number one thing you can know and the number one thing you can do is to know this. More than answers, more than solutions, people who are struggling with substance abuse just want to know that they have not been forgotten by the people that matter to them. They just want to know that someone will sit with them when sitting with themselves has become too painful a place to be. You can go to that person, you can call them, because I know right now we're in a situation where being physically present with some people is not possible, but you can call them and you can say, I love you. I love you whether you're using or you're not. I love you whatever state you're in. And if you ever need me, I will be there for you because I don't want you to be alone or feel alone. When you do that, the person will feel seen and they will feel heard. They will be reminded that their struggles are not what is important to you. They are important to you. It is the same thing as saying that, listen, I see how much this life hurts you. I see how much pain it causes you. And I want you to know it makes sense. And I love you. If you do that, they may ask you to stay with them and they may ask you for help. Mm. Dude, I get motivated and inspired every time I, I listen to you talk. And what I love about about you and your ability to, to share your story is you just kind of just go with it, man. And it's just, yeah. you just speak life and you speak from the soul and from experience. And for those listening to this, this is going to be something you're going to want to really dive more into with Adam's story and look at what he's doing. And whether you're plant-based, whether you're, for, you're keto, you're pale, whatever the case may be, you have to establish some sense of connection to the way you're eating. 
and make sure that you are eating in a way that's aligned with who you want to be as a person. That if you want to feel more confident, you want to feel better mentally, you want to look better, whatever it is, just make sure that you're making conscious choices that align with that and then be connected to something greater than that. So Adam, people can find you at plant-based addict on Instagram. And then is there any other place? Yeah, I have a Facebook page by the same title, plant-based addict. And if you guys want to, you can check out the, the, the research study. You can go to my nonprofit, plantbasedforpositivechange.org. And we also have a GoFundMe campaign. If you want, you can make a contribution. There's literally, so like, Doug, I know you have like, what, like 10,000 followers on Instagram right now, 12,000 followers. Right. If every single one of your followers was to donate $2, that would pay for the entire microbiome sequencing. Like people think that it requires this massive contribution to be a part of something huge. Literally donate $2. It matters. It absolutely matters. Mm. All right, man. I will be sure to put all this stuff in the show notes of the episode so people can find out more about you. I know you got to go. You got a coaching call to be on. But for those listening to this, take a screenshot of the episode, tag Adam, tag myself with your biggest takeaway. We'd love to hear your feedback, what you thought of Adam's story and his tips on nutrition. And once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst. We'll see you next time.